so this slippery terrain is that is that flipping of the narrative or is is um, kind of naming that that dynamic of saying you know rather than take responsibility for it we've we've let homelessness um, slip into um, or, or be equated with madness I'm Joita Gupta and this is the pulse the stereotype that many homeless people also have mental health diagnoses is so entrenched that most people don't even question it. This idea also crops up in several modern films about homelessness. In documentaries especially, there is a tendency to seemingly conflate homelessness with madness. The on-screen depiction of homelessness helps in this way to create a distinction between the homeless and those in the middle class. This portrayal is neither accidental nor innocent. It stems from the logic that homelessness is a result of madness rather than societal factors. And if homelessness is perceived as an individual biochemical problem, then there are far reaching consequences for the solutions put forward. Today, we discuss the depiction of homelessness in documentaries. It's time to put your finger on the pulse. Hello and welcome to The Pulse on AMI-audio. I'm Joyita Gupta. Today we're talking about homelessness and how homelessness is depicted in documentaries. For those of you who are visually impaired or blind as I am, I just wanted to describe the background. I am a brown skinned. I have dark hair, which is pulled back in a bun. I am wearing a gray sweater. It's a crop neck sweater. And you might be able to see from my left ear one headphone, which is where I'm getting my screen reader. I mean, that's how it's, that's been piped through. I'm sitting against a white background today, but that's the description portion of it. I just wanted to make sure we're all on the same page and I love to know what people are wearing. So now you know what I'm wearing, but my guest today is Tim Martin. Tim Martin's article, narrating the housing crisis, encountering madness, homelessness, and neoliberal logic was recently published in the Canadian Journal of Disability Studies. Tim, hello and welcome to the program. It's great to have you. It's really great to be here. Thanks Thanks so much for having me. Before we dig into your uh, article, I wanted to ask you a little bit about some key concepts. You talk a little bit about a neoliberal logic that has governed some of the portrayals of homelessness. What do you mean by this neoliberal logic? Yeah, so... Um, I, I think when people hear the word neoliberal or neoliberalism, people people sort of say you know they associate it with the free market and they say oh you know um, you know let the market correct itself and and they think of neoliberalism in, in those terms um, and there's a lot of really compelling work um, now uh, and in the past number of years that situates neoliberalism also as a kind of rationality. I talk about neoliberal rationality, um, a kind of way of thinking. So what happens um, when we when we look at the rise of neoliberalism, when we look at kind of the 1980s to today, the, it, it also is embedded in a kind of thinking that sees the sees everyone as individual individuals, and a lot of people, um, you know, go back to Margaret Thatcher, right? Like there is no such thing as society. There is, um, you know, there is no collective. You know, the end of of this kind of notion of collective care right so um so this kind of way of thinking s suggests then that we are all responsible just for our own lot and you know we have to figure it out ourselves and you know if anything is a problem if there's a problem with us it's because we haven't been you know trying hard enough you know pulling ourselves up by our by our bootstraps well enough um and that's and that's i mean that's a tip of the iceberg kind of um way of situating that kind of neoliberal rationality and and there's all kinds of writers talking about how the you know the implications of that in um social policy and education and and, and what have you but um yeah and you are one of them but the other key concept that you talk about is a critical mad studies framework can you bring us up to speed about what that is yeah so i mean i touch on um a small you know few kind of theorists and, and thinkers that 
um, that sort of situate, help me situate my critique. Um, I think that, you know, broadly Mad Studies is, is in the, the work of, um, you know, questioning the psychiatric-centered uh, you know, psychiatric -centered, um, outlook on, um, you know, what, what we term mental illness or, um, you know, psychiatric illness. And it's it questioning these sort of regimes of power that say, um, you know, solutions can only be found in the work of diagnosing and sort of fixing the quote unquote mad citizen, right, the, or the mad uh, individual. Um, and so uh, the critical mad studies framework that I use um, is drawn on, in part anyways, is drawn on a study that was in itself um, a work of collective care, you know, it was, it was done by the Wellesley Institute and, um, and it was, it was, uh, it was a particip participatory action research study, um, that included voices of, of mad individuals, uh, folks, um, uh, with lived experience of, of homelessness, um, or, or being dehoused, as some of us would say, um, by the state and, and being abandoned by the state. And it was done, uh, you know, also with mad studies researchers and academics and, but it was this kind of collective work of, um, of critiquing psi centered ways of thinking, psychiatric centered, uh, ways of thinking and, and diagnosing and individualizing, uh, you know, and isolating, you know, individuals and, and, um, and so that, that's kind of where the, where I lodge my, critical mad studies, uh, approach, uh, is there as well as elsewhere, but yeah. And, and so what got you thinking about the documentary film genre and its handling of the homeless population and some of the issues surrounding why people end up being homeless? Yeah. It, a really circuitous route. Um, I, I am not a filmmaker. I, I, I mean, I enjoy films. Um, I, I partway through my PhD, I did a, an entire, you know, sort of 180, um, where I changed everything I was doing. And, and, the, and part of the reason for that was, um, you know, a sort of, uh, lifelong, uh, or for, for many, many years, um, being involved in kind of, um, community, uh, work, uh, you know, alongside, um, marginalized folks, uh, street involved folks. Um, but also, uh, constantly thinking about how these topics were being, you know, arranged or presented or portrayed in the media. Um, and, you know, being frustrated by that. Um, and then in particular, um, one of the things, this might seem, you know, a bit out of left field, but one of the things that motivated this particular, um, study and how I, how I went about it was, I attended this panel discussion, you know, a couple of years back, and there was there was this discussion. It was with a lot of folks who were involved in organizing in Toronto, you know, folks from Ontario Council uh, Coalition Against po Poverty and uh, the um, Shelter Housing and Justice Network, and and so on. And one of the questions someone someone asked a question, you know, during the Q and A, and they said, you know, what what about housing first? Like, isn't there this thing now? Uh, you know, everyone's talking about, right. And, and we're, we're just, we're housing people. Like we're, we're going away from this sort of archaic linear model of housing, which I talk about in the paper. And, you know, is this, is this just another piece of the neoliberal puzzle? Um, you know, is it, is it being critiqued or is it, is it as good as it sounds, you know, kind of thing. And, and so the answer was kind of like, you know, this is, an imperfect solution. It is problematic and no one's really talking about it, you know, or no one's really talking about like the, some of the problems that come out of this, this housing first, so-called housing first model, right. Um, where we're, we're fixing homelessness and we're supposedly putting everyone in homes now. Um, and, and so that was one of the pieces of the puzzle that when I wanted to look at film and when I wanted to look at these portrayals, I want, I specifically, you know, tried to find it, especially in the, in the Canadian example that I use, um, an example where we were, um, kind of lauding and, and kind of, you know, in an unquestioning way, you know, this, this perfect solution that we now apparently have, you know, even though many of us know that 
the, the housing crisis has only ever been worse than, you know, in, in, for 40 years. Um, so, so that was, that was uh, kind of how I found myself there. And so what are some of the documentaries that you're looking at and how do those documentaries take up homelessness specifically? Yeah, so I, I mainly look at I look at two, I guess. Um, I, I reference a number, but um, I I look at there's the example from the states is uh, by a filmmaker uh, James Burns, who who did a sort of a short short film on um, you know the the crisis um, of of mental health, mental illness as it's termed, and uh, but also associated with the housing crisis in Arizona in a, in a small county in Arizona. Um, and then I, I couple that with, um, you know, what seems like a very kind of banal, um, short, almost new, just sort of newsy piece, uh, you know, from CTV, um, around housing first and around the housing crisis in Toronto. And I, I wanted to do that. Um, I wanted to offer a Canadian example, obviously. Um, but I also, I wanted to um, uh, pick something that, that just is like, you know, people have said like, well, this is like not even, you know, it's not like this is going to win a documentary film award. This is just like a really basic, um, you know, kind of news film video piece. Um, and, and my point is kind of exactly like this is, this is just the, the most basic, this is the stuff that's constantly coming out of, you know, whether it's CTV or, or wherever, right. Um, where you get your, your sort of daily fix of, of film-based media, um, concerning, concerning homelessness, this is classic. Like, so I just picked something that was like as, as run of the mill as possible in a way. Um, but I made sure that it, it touched on some of these, these central issues, right. And it, it um, touched on housing first and it, and it attempted to kind of capture the quote unquote voice of those with lived experience. And that was, that was one of my parameters for, for both films. So uh, for James Burns's film and, and for the CTV film, the attempt to narrate for and with those with lived experience of, of homelessness. Tim, you're reading my mind because I was about to ask you about who it is that we're actually hearing from in the documentaries that you've examined. Are we mostly hearing from uh, the homeless population itself or is it social workers and the police who are going to narrate the experience of homelessness through their specific experience of it? Yeah, that's, yeah, it's a great uh, question and, and some great points. I mean, um, it, it's a mix. I mean, and, and what's interesting about the James Burns piece is that there isn't, or, or say there's a lot less of this kind of overarching narration where, you know, he's attempting to say, you know, this is what I'm, this is what I want you to get out of this film, or this is what, you know, you, is your takeaway. But he's interviewing a lot of different pieces of the puzzle. He's inter interviewing folks, you know, deeply embedded in this sort of carceral system of, of um, you know, prisons and, and carceral psychiatry, um, and and kind of um, you know traditional uh, forms of of discipline <laughs> and and you know um, policing, but he's also interviewing peer workers. Um, he's also interviewing folks with lived experience. There's there's one uh, man in particular who is Armando, who is the sort of central figure of the film. Um, who is uh, currently, or at least at the time, is unhoused. Um, and he takes up a, a good portion of the film, you know, talking with him and, and, and sort of letting him speak for himself. So it's interesting in that way um, that he, he's trying to, um, without too much editorializing, kind of offer these different um, perspectives. And then the CTV um, piece, as you can imagine, is very narrated, very heavily um, kind of mediated through the voice of a narrator, right? So um, yes, they interview, uh, and, and again, this is just classic, right? So they interview um, Merrick, who has lived experience of homelessness, but it's very heavily um, narrated and and kind of um, his, his reality is um, presented, you know, in, in, in many ways that I get into in the paper. So um, but but both are, are attempting to kind of offer these different um, yeah angles, I guess. 
Mm -hmm. One of the phrases that you include in the paper that really jumps off the page, at least it did to me, was you said that there's a slippery terrain between homelessness and madness. Can you expand on that for, for us as well? Yeah, so, um, geez, I wish I, you know, had the paper in front of me. It's a great question. Um, I think that um, one of the main um, points that, that has led me into, you know, sort of what I'm writing my dissertation on and, and, and my, my writing more generally and my thinking more generally is that, you know, we often are, are saying, you touched on this in, in your really well written introduction um you, you somehow captured it all in like 30 seconds um but is when we talk about the homeless you know the the people on the street um what we have this societal sort of expectation that this this lack of productivity this lack of lack of sort of capitalist involvement this uh you know, unemployability or whatever it is, is, is rooted. Well, it's because it's because, you know, they're mentally ill. It's because they're, um, you know, that, that they have these, these psychiatric problems. And if only, and so the neoliberal expectation is if only we could allow them to, if we could diagnose them properly, we could label them properly, then we could fix them, right. Then they would be good, um, members of capitalist society, right? They would be good contributors. Um, as opposed to a narrative that says, when we allow people to be dehoused, when we when we set up in policy um, and we 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 gut our social assistance um, you know dollars and 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 so on, we set up a situation that is traumatizing. Uh, we set up a situation that is deeply violent. Um, and, and results in, yes, all kinds of levels of, of social and emotional and psychiatric distress. This is, these are distressed people, um, and, and being dehoused, being evicted, being, um, you know, isolated in these ways is a deeply traumatizing experience, uh, you know, as, as we can all imagine. So, but rooting this, um, you know, conversation in a, in a way that suggests that rooting it in that way suggests that we are all at fault, you know, suggests that it's something that we have actually voted for. It's something that we have um, promoted and supported in policy. And that ultimately as members of this society, we are deeply, um, unfortunately, deeply guilty of and, and need to take responsibility for each of us. Um, and and so this slippery terrain is that is that flipping of the narrative or is is um, kind of naming that that dynamic of saying you know rather than take responsibility for it we've we've let homelessness um, slip into um, or, or be equated with madness or we've or vice versa you know whatever in whichever way it happens um, and we've we've let that um, kind of be a be now it's now it's not our fault now it's their fault it's it's this um you know shrugging off of the of the responsibility um actually i should say too uh, before i forget while i'm on that is uh the original uh title of the piece was was actually going to be a quote from from derek seawood who's a peer worker in uh, the james burns burns piece um where he says we are all at fault you know and the, and so the my original title and this got worked out in, through the peer review process and whatever, but was, was, we are all at fault. It's, that's the, um, it was the original title of the piece. Um, mm. Yeah. That's very profound. I mean, it almost seems like by relying on psychiatric labels, we're using the psychiatric label as a shortcut or a way not to have to think about the systemic causes of homelessness. I wanted to ask you about one specific interaction that I think a lot of us have witnessed, and that is the interaction between the homeless population and the police. In the documentaries that you're looking at, how do they treat that relationship? Do they do that relationship justice in terms of representing it accurately? Do they paint an overly glossy picture? Or do the documentaries you look at actually need to be more critical in terms of examining the relationship between the homelessness pop the homeless population and the police? That's a great question. Um... You know, I would say, uh, I would say the CTV piece. It's safe to say, you know, no, they don't deal with that. Um, you know, 
in any kind of meaningful way. Um, I think that, um, and, and I say this in the paper, is that, you know, what what is posed as the solution is is very simply that um, this person, you know, Merrick Roblowski, he was given a diagnosis, you know, he was, and he, and he, and he accepted the diagnosis, you know, he was given it, he accepted it and he, and he, therefore he could be fixed. And, and, and that was it. Right. And, and before that he, yeah, he's positioned as, um, you know, irresponsible, um, perhaps, uh, dangerous or at least dangerous to himself. Um, and so the, and I, I, there's a, a quote that I use in the piece that's the mad, bad and dangerousness stereotype. Um, and that comes out of some earlier mad studies literature. Um, but the James Burns piece is interesting in that way. Um, you know, the, the sort of, I, I think it's the deputy sheriff or whatever of Cochise County, Arizona is interviewed in the film. And, you know, he clearly is sympathetic or he clearly has, you know, compassion, but it's, it's, again, it's, unfortunately it's rooted in these like neoliberal expectations, right. That we've all been conditioned by. It's not like, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's everywhere. Um, and, and yet, um, there's at the same time, there's, there's this questioning of, um, who is dangerous and who is at risk of, of danger. Um, and there's this moment where Armando who is unhoused is, uh, you know, evicted or, or yet again prevented from from accessing a safe place to sleep for the night, um, and they and they show this in the film, and he is is forced to then say, and he says this to the camera, like I'm going to go find, you know, uh, you know, a back alley or a, a you know, but but a safe a safe a place as I can find, you know, and I, I forget the exact line, but but what is highlighted there. And what and what is true in the research and in literature is that who is at most risk of being, um, you know, uh, in a dangerous situation is Armando, right? As opposed, and and that is um, sort of implicit in the film. I would say it's not, you know, again, it's not heavily narrated, right? So the the narrator doesn't step in and say, here are the statistics on, you know how at risk this population is but what they're suggesting to the viewer i would argue is that here is a case where um rather than say um the housed citizens you know folks like me are at risk you know of these dangerous mad people roaming our streets it's saying now here's a case where someone is dealing with dehousing and they are very they're in a very precarious situation they're in a very dangerous situation and the research um you know uh definitively shows that that is the case and that armando is the one at risk right now um as, as opposed to the other way around so they they do um they do show that we just have a minute or so left and in that minute i'd like to ask you how you'd like to see documentary films evolve in terms of their portrayal of uh, homelessness and whether you'd like to see them in fact move away from the conflation of homelessness and madness yeah i i touch on that in the, in the conclusion and i i try to you know suggest that there's there's perhaps not a way to say you know to to um, create the mad studies version and documentary, right? Like, because the point is that we're allowing people to narrate for themselves. So there's lots of folks that don't take on this label of madness or, or sort of, um, the, the politically charged, um, you know, individuals that want to, uh, disrupt, you know, conventional notions of, of this sort of psychiatric regime, et cetera. Um, there's lots of folks that, that, you know, and, and it comes out in the, in the Wellesley Institute study that I, that I cite that there's, there are folks that say, you know, my medication helped me, um, and my diagnosis helped me, um, in, in such and such a way. So there, there's not, um, the, the point is that what needs to happen are documentaries that really listen to people and really allow people, uh, with lived experience to speak and to guide the conversation. Um, and, and maybe more than one, you know, both of those films are examples that choose one subject, 
um, which could be okay. But again, like, um, and then, and then the other, um, you know, a sort of flip side to that is I, I reference a, a film, an older film called Shelter from the Storm and Shelter from the Storm came out of Tent City in Toronto, you know, sort of 20 years ago. Right. And what it does that I find interesting is it, it situates, it, it rather, it doesn't situate, it just interviews people and there's folks you know, I know for a fact there's folks in the film with lived experience and those that are housing activists and otherwise. And the, there's not this sort of sense of like division or narration that says, you know, okay, now I'm talking to a non-productive citizen. And now I'm talking to an unhoused citizen or now I'm talking to, you know, someone with a steady job, um, but rather letting citizens speak for themselves and, and um, not sort of, uh, you know, buying into this sort of division of like, um, having to name and label um, people. And so, but I think, yeah, I think filmmakers need to be, um, you know, modeling this, that, that we're in dialogue, all of us in dialogue as citizens together, we're all part of this messy public, right. That is, is, um, you know, politically and socially responsible to one another and, um, and, and needs to care for one another. Um, so that's that's kind of you know filmmakers I think have an opportunity to model that um, in in their documentaries. And we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much for speaking to me today. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Tim Martin recently published an article in the Canadian Journal of Disability Studies, which is about narrating the housing crisis. That's all the time we have for today. If you have any feedback for us, you can always write to feedback at ami.ca or find us on Twitter at AMI Audio. Use the hashtag PulseAMI. You're also welcome to subscribe to the podcast or subscribe to the YouTube channel where you are also free to leave a comment. And of course, you'll also be notified about future YouTube videos if you are able to subscribe. Our technical producer is Marco Florlo. Our videographers today are Ted Cooper and Matthew McGurk. And Andy Frank is the manager of AMI-audio. I've been your host, Chuita Gupta. Thanks for listening.